Hi there, everybody in Bangkok, and hi, everyone joining us. Um, my name is Megan Hill. I work for USAID, um, and I wanted to welcome you to uh, the first webinar that we're doing in conjunction with uh, the Global Wildlife Program at the World Bank. Um, I think we have mutual objectives in expanding our reach and sharing uh, the lessons learned from combating wildlife trafficking. So I just wanted to welcome you to our first webinar. I often will wait a couple of minutes as people join uh, just to get let everyone get, get settled in and get signed on. But uh, we have a really packed agenda today, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started now that it's uh, on time. Um, so welcome. I did want to let you all know that we are recording this webinar and we will post the link uh, at the end of the session so that you can also find it uh, later on in the chat box. We'll be using the chat box today uh, to answer your questions. Just to maintain audio quality for everyone, uh, we are muting everyone. Uh, if you have any kind of connection problems or have any questions, please do use the, the chat box. We'll be monitoring that. Um, you want to, the next slide, please? So here at USAID, uh, we use a theory of change approach in our programming for biodiversity conservation. And this is just a quick snapshot of um, the theory of change that we use for our collaborative learning groups, where we are really interested in learning and improving how we conserve wildlife, um, both through consumer demand reduction, increasing community conservation, and building capacity for effective law enforcement. We use this framework to come up with a series of learning questions. If you can go to the next slide, please. Where we really focus our learning programs to answer, in this case, a guiding question around what does effective demand reduction look like? And in this case, and in this webinar, I'm really pleased to say that the presentations that we're about to hear really address all three of these details around what does it look when we try to reduce the supply of illegal wildlife products? Um, how do we measure that? And then also, how can we learn from different messaging strategies? So I really wanted to thank and welcome our, our guest speakers today. If we can have the next slide. We have two examples of projects, uh, one of which is USAID Wildlife Asia, where Eleonora de Guzman, the leader for our social and behavior change communication, We'll work with Trends Digital, Sunny Patel, and David Garcia to explain the results of a campaign, a digital online campaign that they worked on, as well as the next slide, please. Welcoming Jan Verdefe and Amy Leung from WWF to talk about a campaign that they are in the middle of running, actually, focusing on Chinese tourists to Thailand and Vietnam. So without further ado, Please let me turn it over to Nora, who's going to give us a bit of an introduction to the work that Wildlife Asia is doing on demand reduction. Thank you all. Um, I, I will point out that at about 25 past the hour, I will give you a one minute war warning so that we can move on to the next. Okay. Uh, thank you, Megan. Good morning, everybody. I'm very glad to be here. So first, uh, as you see on the slide, I'd like to introduce our project, USAID Wildlife Asia. We have four objectives, as you can see on the slide. The first being reduce consumer demand through social and behavior change communication. And then the three other objectives you can see, uh, for lack of time, I will no longer read it. We are based in Bangkok and we are a contract funded by USAID, the Regional Development Mission for Asia and the consortium is led by RTI International as prime, and we have five subcontractors. Next slide, please. Next, please. We implemented the digital deterrence campaign in Thailand to address the trend for online purchase of wildlife products based on findings from our own USAID Wildlife Asia's consumer research in 2018. Our findings validated those from other studies as well. We launched this pilot innovation using digital marketing to deter online buyers from pursuing their purchase. We used Google as the main platform. Since this is very popular in Thailand, we developed ads aimed at creating a hostile, uncomfortable, risky online trading environment among potential buyers 
who generally go online with the feeling of anonymity and comfort. Next, please. We partnered with the government agency, Department of National Parks, Wildlife, and Plant Conservation. We used uh, four languages, Thai, English, Chinese, and Vietnamese. Chinese and Vietnamese were aimed at travelers from China and Vietnam. Based on results from our research and other studies, there is a significant proportion of Chinese and Vietnamese travelers who acquire wildlife products in Thailand. We used four message concepts, which I will discuss later, and monitored results and trackers through digital analytics. And the, the campaign was online for seven months from August 2018 to March 2019. Now, how does the campaign work? Next slide, please. Next slide. When someone does a Google search using one of a list of selected sensitive keywords that denote potential interest in buying illegal wildlife online, obtained from other wildlife organizations doing online monitoring of trade, one of four alternative Google ads will appear. If the person clicks on the link, as you will see, www.illegalwildlifetrade.info, accompanying the ad, the person will be directed to a landing page sponsored by the DNP. The landing page contains a warning message that the content being searched may be prohibited and Thai authorities are monitoring illegal wildlife trade online. Next slide, please. So this is the landing page. Note the look of the visual. The color is black, two circles symbolize a set of eyes looking at you, and the message warning is in red. This is in line with creating a hostile environment online and increasing the perception of personal risk in the potential buyer. Next slide, please. We designed the Google ads using our SBCC approach based on evidence from our 2018 consumer research, which revealed key drivers and concerns regarding use of elephant and tiger products. For both ivory and tiger, the major perceived benefits or drivers, you, you see them in red, are beliefs that these two products bring good luck and or protect from evil. The concerns in green are possible deterrents to purchase. We see that concerns about legality are significant for both ivory and tiger. We thus develop the ads around these drivers and concerns. Next slide, please. So we developed four message concepts. The first is searching for you. Second is searching for bad luck. Third is can you afford the fines? The fourth is official alert. And each of these concepts were developed covering elephant, tiger, pangolin, and rhino in four languages, as I said, Thai, English, Chinese, and Vietnamese. Pangolin and rhino ads were mainly targeted at travelers in Thailand since our consumer research showed no significant local consumption of these two product types in Thailand. Next slide, please. This is just to show you how the Google ads appeared based on the four creative concepts. These are just sample legal uh, Google ads. So the first you see searching for illegal ivory. The second is uh, don't buy bad luck or amulets. The third is can you afford the fines? The fourth is official alert. And at the bottom, you can see that trade in trafficked ivory is illegal, always undercover, officers are online. For all three ads, and then the fourth official alert, your search has triggered an alert. So these are just how the Google ads appeared when the searcher uh, used a keyword to search. So I'll give the, the, the presentation over to David and Sunny we we'll discuss the key results. Thank you very much, Nora. Um, hi, my name is Sunny here. I'm sitting next to uh, David. Hi, David. Hi, everyone. Hi there. So we're going to walk you through uh, some of the results we found through this um, through this project, which uh, David and I just realized we've been working on for about two years now. So 
it's great to see that we have an audience to share some of the results. So um, first steps, I'll just do a quick recap of what we did, and then uh, at the end, we'll show you what our next steps are. But first, what we did. So we ran a campaign um, August 2018 to mid-March 2019 using Google Search for about 223 days, as Nora mentioned. But um, what we did is that we used Google in its opposite um, format. So typically, Google is meant to drive you to places, and we were trying to get the messaging before someone would drive somewhere. So typically, Google is great if you want to buy shoes, it tells you what type of shoes to buy, you click on it, you go to the e-com, and you purchase. Someone looking to buy an elephant or um, tiger paw or tiger heart, well, we're going to make it a bit more difficult for them. So uh, hence the messages that you saw. But what we didn't quite realize actually was how impactful and cost effective it was because since we were um, changing the rules a bit in terms of we didn't really want people to click necessarily we wanted people to get the message that even searching for these things could lead to um, you know bad circumstances if, if, if they're breaking laws so we focused on um, a couple uh, other points I'd like to mention is one is that we were also had to follow all privacy regulations um, as a private company, which we did, um, which is, I think, um, something that's kudos to the team because it's quite hard with all these changing regulations to do so. And then the other thing is that during this period of time, we were able to get over half a million impressions. Um, and I'll talk to you about the real um, so surprise we had in terms of the below market costing. We were geolocated, geolocated, focused on Thailand and English. Um, we averaged about 2.6 thousand searches a day over the campaign over the campaign period, with uh, tracked just under 600 thousand keyword searches in Google. Um, ivory dominated with over 90 percent, uh, then followed by rhino and tiger, um, and then. If you would have to say, there's, there are, and David will talk much more detail about some of these specifics. However, in general, our, um, the market uh, you know, was dominated by 25 to 44 year old male metropolitan. Um, and then some interesting things, which we'll talk a bit more about lower income searches were linked um, in, in, with more Thai local searches, Thai language searches versus top income bracket searches were much more related to English related. Um, and then, of course, mobile pl platforms is just where the vast majority of people search, which is a very think, good learning for everyone to ensure uh, that all your sites are mobile optimized. I'm saying this because we all do typically sites on computers, desktops. We, we rarely do the check, but actually that's where the consumers are. Um, and then, as mentioned, it was really 50 percent, even more, almost 55 percent, close to 60 percent below what we would normally see from a cost per impression basis, because essentially we were trying to get the message out rather than have them force them to click. Uh, and so hence we were allowed to get a lot more value from this budget um, than we expected. And then also we had structured it, this was this this one, this one in particular is phase one out of, there's another phase, so we actually have some scalable learnings. Um, and then lastly, but not least, we had some unexpected positive con consequences from this for instance, being able to really shut down some online stores, which, you know, for us um, as, you know, digital specialists and, and working with many large companies, our KPIs had kind of come to life to us in terms of being able to actually uh, make a difference. So we're quite proud in that, even though we did not do that, we just passed over the information to our partners who then uh, did the appropriate actions. But um, with that introduction, I'll leave it on to David. Hi everyone. So based off Sunny's intro, um, I'll just help you help walk you through a few more of these stats in detail. Uh, so just picking up at the top, which is the total number of impressions and or keyword searches that were made by the users uh, sitting at 596,000 keyword searches. Um, we served a total of 560,000 of those. This makes up about 94% of the total search share. What this results in is that we dominated in position one on Google as the first result, getting us very high visibility for all our messaging and the messaging that Nora presented to you guys. Next. Um, 
uh, since Sonia already kind of delved into quite a, little, quite a lot of the demographical details, but we wanted to highlight what makes us special in this case because it's uh, uh, search-based. It gave us a lot of information and details about how these users approach their search behavior and the discovery around these products. And so we want to highlight this for you guys to give you a better understanding of, of, of yeah, how, how does this happen in a demand-based uh, uh, driven uh, platform. And so uh, just starting off with English, because assuming that <laughs> the majority of the people on the call will be uh, more familiar with English than in Thai, uh, the majority of the searches were around broad ivory. Uh, what is it used for? Ivory types? Uh, is it legal? Uh, and other searches in detail. It's, 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 it goes quite deep. We're talking hundreds of thousands of records here. Um, the second biggest category was accessories and items. This is now the area where we'd say, okay, we got to look more into this kind of stuff because it does hint at interest for a specific product, uh, especially in the fashion accessory items uh, segments. Things like tiger amulet, tiger tooth fangs, ivory caps or necklaces, seals, and so on. Um, it gets now a bit more into the macabre, which is about more than 5% actually searches made around animal parts specifically such as pangolin scales, rhino horns, tiger fangs. Uh, and then uh, to just one up that one, uh, purchases of whole animals, like tiger for sale, real baby tiger for sale, buy an elephant on all those things. Um, and then just uh, s some that are more around uh, what we would consider the early discovery and consideration period of our consumers uh, in the B2C markets. In this instance, these questions for this, uh, within this illicit behavior pattern, uh, are more about learning more about uh, product and purchase details such as the prices and or the, the quality levels of the products. Next. So basing the intro on the on the, um, the English keywords and behavior within that, uh, we just gonna highlight the key differences towards Thai. Um, and for Thai, the, the first thing that pops into mind is that Sorry, we have a bit of an audio problem here. Yeah, uh, so I'll just go along. Um, let me know if it gets too bad. So uh, regardless of that, um, the highest count of, of searches in Thai are accessory and item related, similar to what happens in English. Uh, the biggest outlier here is uh, religion or belief based searches. Uh, specifically with impact or experience purpose, that being for searching for ivory necklace for luck, power, or fortune, uh, and a lot of uh, searches made in conjunction with the end product type, being amulet, bracelet, and so on. Um, there is one more thing that differentiates the English searches, and that is a lot of searches um, uh, that aim for more quality differentiation, things that we would only expect from consumers that are more informed at that stage. Uh, just quickly to add in, so there was actually in Thailand a whole sub-community where there's, you know, as you know, quite um, quite a large uh, uh, amount of vocabulary we were not aware of. Yeah, and connoisseurs. We had, yeah, almost connoisseurs, like grading the quality of the animal grade. So uh, as we looked into the searches, we had to go to the team and say, what does this mean? And then they actually had to search to understand what this slang or, you know, mm. was wording meant. Correct. Thanks for that, Sonny. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Just a bit of a, a, a palate cleanser. <laughs> uh, uh, and we, draw, we drew up a user journey map just to give you guys a sense of how these, um, these stats play into, uh, uh, from, end to, from beginning to end. And so um, just starting off 596K searches overall um, that then lead into uh, 560,000 uh, ads that we served. Of those ads that we served, uh, uh, what we see as a positive note is that uh, only very few people actually click through. That is a total 17,000 clicks to site, of which we identified 13,000 to be unique. Um, on site then, uh, there was a few additional actions that users could take. Uh, one just nice takeaway on the landing page itself is that the repeat sessions was very, very low, uh, hinting at a potential uh, a positive deterrence effect. On to the next slide, please. So the actions on page that I mentioned prior um, were 
in different sections, laid out in different sections to first go in with a deterrence effect, but then allow people to learn more and be more informed as to why their actions uh, uh, contribute to illicit behavior patterns. And so the first action that we uh, ask people to take if they were keen to do so, is to click on the DMP page, uh, uh, Department of National uh, Wildlife and Parks page to learn more about this issue. Uh, the second action that users could take was uh, to send uh, a message about infractions. And the third one was to call the helpline. And out of all the uh, potential actions on the page, we measured 523 positive actions out of all the sessions that were on the site, which results in about 30%. Um, it was great to see that a lot of messages were sent and, and the hotlines were actually called. Next slide, please. Just to wrap up with a few additional learnings before I hand it back to Sunny is that um, Vietnamese and Chinese on Google search itself uh, did get terminated because the uh, search volume was not as, as big as we uh, initially anticipated. And we also wanted to centralize our efforts. Um, there is some learnings here as well that Google search may just not be the right platform, but it does not mean that we don't believe this is happening somewhere else. Uh, in addition to that, um, although we were able to categorize a lot of these search terms and potential behaviors related to that, there is still so much information in, in those 560 plus thousand records um, that it still requires more in-depth review. Uh, one thing that came out clear in the performance of the ads itself is that the official alert creative concept had the strongest uh, uh, deterrence effect together with the searching for you ad sets. Um, there was no seasonality across the year. We ran for about, not full year, but for 223 days. And within the, that period, we did not identify any seasonality. Um, and basing it off of all this and this full run through and the multiple opt optimizations that we did across the uh, across this period, uh, we're now quite happy with having an optimized and scalable model that can be transferred into other countries as needed and or to other projects as well. Great, David. Um, so just on to me, I'm, I'm wondering how we're doing on time. I'll just continue. Um, you're great, Sunny. You're great, Sunny. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So this um, last slide here, in terms of plan next steps. Um, so first of all, now that we've compiled all this data, we want to clean it out. Now, why is that? Actually, um, to take a fishing analogy, you know, we, we've got a big net, and uh, for sure we've 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 caught the catch we wanted. However, you know, there's some really some really nice, beautiful fish that belong back in the ocean. So. We're going to clean it out a bit, um, and we're going to be. These are these are next steps. We're just in the process of finalizing all the plans and and POs and things of this nature. But um, we want to really separate the you know the high intent uh, you know malicious users versus the educational and the researchers. Uh, we're going to be running A B C ad types. Um, it's the same as A B, just with the C. For those who, who are in digital marketing, nothing special there. But what we're doing is we're running a, a once we're doing kind of a uh, traffic-like protocol, mix of online sur surveys. So we want to stratify the group, break them out into different areas. Like for instance, you know, green, amber, and red. Uh, for the green, it's a very different message. These are people who are just researchers, curious. You know, they got into our our list, and we want them to, you know, um, help and learn more and support back. And we're going to encourage that. Um, and then for the ones in amber, we, we're going to reassess uh, and, and and try to understand which ones fall more on the green side and the red side. And then ones on the red side, this is where we're going to amplify it a bit and also start um, using social networks and other platforms in order to follow the user outside their initial uh, illicit search. And then again, these are for people who consistently are not getting the message. Um, and then for other items is that we are adding more social platforms. This is to be uh, confirmed and we're in discussions right now about how that looks like, but however, there's a lot of scalability there. And uh, last but not least, I'd say that there's, you see here, dark web phishing. I think David just mentioned earlier that there's some discussion whether Google is the right platform. Now, Google is the right platform if we want to do deterrence for consumers. I mean, meaning because all the searches typically happen there. So, you know, at that margin, I think we're okay. However, um, as we shut down stores on, on Facebook and on the web and all these things, the semi-pros are going dark. Um, and we are aware of that and we have some things 
uh, in the pipeline, but nothing um, to discuss at this point in time. But I hope all that was useful for everyone. Useful for and everyone. Um, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Sunny. Um, if we could go ahead to the next slide. I did want to note to everyone, um, I am noting your questions down and we'll come back um, at the end for some Q&A. Um, so without further ado, I want to pass it over to Jan Vertifay to talk about WWF's recent demand production campaign. So over to you, Jan. Thanks, Megan. And Thanks. really, really impressive campaign, uh, David and Sunny and Nora. I'm really a big fan of that one. Um, so Annie and I are going to share the first year results from WF's Travel Ivory Free campaign. And this is part of our larger ivory initiative to one, close pro problematic markets and to reduce demand. With this campaign specifically, we wanted to uh, reach our target audience before and during their travels when they might have the opportunity to buy ivory. We wanted to disrupt this buying at key decision points. So to do this, we use digital precision marketing and we partner with some of the biggest travel companies in Asia through the World Travel and Tourism Council. Right, next slide. And this campaign focuses on a very specific demographic. It's Chinese consumers who regularly travel outside of mainland China. And that's because our research shows that these consumers are among the so-called die-hard buyer cohort who continue to want to buy ivory despite the, the ban in China, despite the law, and despite other deterrents. So we ran the campaign twice during the last year, during the two biggest travel seasons in China. And during these um, holiday periods, there were an estimated to be more than 14 million outbound trips taken by Chinese travelers. We launched in Thailand for Golden Week last October because it's the number one destination for these travelers. We then added Vietnam during Lunar New Year, and we will add Japan and Hong Kong for the upcoming Golden Week 2019 campaign, which launches next week. Uh, next slide. We used some new tactics for this campaign, which Annie will describe in more detail, and we were very impressed by the reach. Our messages were viewed and shared more than 100 million times during a total of about 20 days of campaigning. Uh, and during the second campaign period, we added a public pledge that people could share on social media as a way to track commitments to traveling ivory free. So during the 10 year Lunar New Year campaign, more than 2 million people took that pledge. Next slide. And now I'll turn it over to Annie to go into more depth about the precision marketing. Yeah, thanks, Jen. Um, so as the previous presenters um, already introduced, actually our precision marketing has been uh, highly embedded into people's daily life now. For example, I searched some uh, home decor products a couple of weeks ago, and every, uh, since then, every time I log on Facebook to check uh, to check my friend's uh, update, uh, uh, some very similar advertisements from a home decor uh, website are showing me very similar photos of the product I searched before online. So that's how this technique has been uh, widely used by many commercial brands nowadays. But in another way, it can also be utilized by NGOs or conservation organizations like us uh, in our work. So we basically created a, a list of different uh, materials to be advertised on social media platforms. Next, please. Um, so these are the messages and uh, key visuals we created for previous uh, Golden Week and the Lunar New Year. And uh, all those uh, messages are created based on uh, WWF's uh, ivory consumption research, uh, which are annual research uh, conducted about um, um, China's um, ivory consumption. And um, and based on our research, we were able to understand consumers' motivation, their deterrent uh, of uh, purchasing ivory, as well as the, the messages that could potentially resonate with them the most. So that's how we created some messages around uh, emotional connection with elephant, some illegality information on laws and uh, penalty, or uh, encouraging them to become responsible traveler and buy uh, alternative souvenirs. Next, please. Um, so in terms of uh, precision marketing, there are also different types of methods that we piloted uh, through previous campaigns. So this is an example of one of the most important techniques uh, that we tried 
uh, through GPS technology to influence those travelers at, um, at key decision points in Thailand and Vietnam. And this table shows the number of users identified by Xinan Weibo, which is one of uh, China's biggest um, a social media platform and uh, similar to Twitter. Um, so on that platform, these are the number of users identified to travel or live in those uh, destination countries in the months of Lunar New Year. And also the number of users identified at some real-time location. Next, please. And uh, here is a more detailed breakdown on Thailand itself. Um, that we, we are able to push our messages to those users' news feed um, once they show, uh, show up around those um, key destinations like some uh, cities, airports, tourist attractions, or shopping destinations. Next, please. And uh, the second way um, we try about uh, precision marketing is through uh, user behavior and interest because uh, for uh, privacy reasons, not every user would like to share their real-time location to a uh, Weibo's APP, but there are still other ways to identify them around um, those uh, destinations. For example, if they recently interacted under certain hashtag or a topic about travel to Thailand or Vietnam, or they made some personal posts uh, containing those keywords. Uh, next, please. Or uh, if they recently followed uh, some official accounts or key opinion leaders like the um, Tourism Authority of Thailand, or uh, if they searched some keywords uh, within Weibo's APP. So through all those user behavior or interest, we are still able to identify those potential or current uh, travelers in those destinations. Next, please. And uh, the third way of precision marketing and, uh, is mostly conducted by WWF ourselves through our collaboration with many important uh, travel industry associations and uh, travel companies and also some high-level celebrities and the key opinion leaders. So through their social accounts, uh, our messages were able to be reposted and to be shown to, to uh, those accounts, uh, followers and fans. Next, please. So this is a demonstration of what the messages look like uh, coming through WWF's official account on Xinan Weibo. Um, and um, the, the bar here shows um, um, a breakdown among the uh, 57 million times of viewership we achieved for Lunar New Year this time, um, the breakdown between different visuals and the messages. And we can see that the elephant one uh, is the most uh, uh, viewed message by the users on Weibo, and also the Lunar New Year one uh, is preferred by many users as well. And uh, you can see from the right corner of all those posts, uh, there is a blue button. So once interested users click uh, through that button, they will enter um, called uh, H5 mini program on Weibo. And uh, through those uh, interactions, they will be able to uh, know more information about poaching or uh, illegality information. Uh, next, please. So after our campaign completion, we are keen to understand those uh, users who actually interacted with us through, through that uh, mini program, and also especially the ones who are targeted uh, uh, through the GPS technology, because that subgroup is uh, the most the key uh, target audience that we want to understand. So through a profile analysis, we were able to learn that most of the users are um, uh, most of the users like uh, travel to uh, destinations like uh, Thailand, Japan, Vietnam, and uh, people born after 1990s are the most presented uh, age group, and most of them uh, have bachelor degree and above. Uh, next, please. So this is another analysis conducted by a social listening third party um, that we want to understand. Uh, the social bias and the sentiment about elephant conservation and ivory ban are raised by our campaign specifically. So through this analysis, we are able to, to see the, the sentiment uh, 
before, during, and after our campaign. And we, we see that um, during our campaign, the public sentiment uh, to support Ivory Ban actually increased by 36%. And um, uh, so it's encouraging to see um, that our campaign has this kind of immediate impact on social media platforms. But on the other hand, we can see that uh, those opinions gradually drop back to the, the normal um, to the normal level after the campaign, which means uh, we need more and more digital campaigns like this uh, to maintain the, the momentum and the, um, so that the behavior change can happen over time. So handing over to Jim, please. And next slide. Thanks, Annie. So to supplement this digital outreach, we held a variety of activities in major tourist destinations. Next slide. And these included some um, fun app opportunities to take selfies, to post on social media with the hashtag and signs to help spread the message. Next slide. And then we know that the number one leisure activity for Chinese travelers is shopping. So we organized an alternative souvenir market in Bangkok, and we did this in coordination with the Tourism Authority of Thailand, and we invited vendors to sell sustainable souvenirs from Thailand. Uh, the vendors were briefed on the ivory laws and passed out our campaign material as well. Uh, next slide. We also unveiled a more serious art installation by one of Thailand's best known sculptors. He designed a red carpet to represent what some consumers see as ivory's glamorous attributes, with the red carpet ending in a pool of blood under a life-sized poached elephant and her calf mourns by her side and one of her tests has been turned into ivory bangles so we invited tourists to observe the sculpture learn more about the ivory trade from displays around it and from volunteers who staff the exhibit next slide and then some of our best collaboration was with two airlines they agreed to have flight attendants read travel ivory free announcements over the PA system during the campaign for all China outbound flights to Thailand and Vietnam. And then one of them also handed out alternative souvenirs with invitations to our events. And I should also add that WF launched a separate campaign during Lunar New Year with Wild Aid and China Customs. And it had a celebrity driven PSA that reminded people it's illegal to bring ivory into China. Um, that campaign was displayed in airports all over the country and is now running on all inbound flights to China. And I'm, I'm sure that John Baker will share more about that during his discussion. Uh, next slide. So some of our key findings in the campaign most successfully engaged young professional women, as Annie mentioned, and millennials and women are key subgroups within the outbound traveler target audience. Uh, so we were successful in reaching them. And now we're looking at ways to better reach men and older travelers. And then this precision marketing was a very cost effective way to reach specific audiences in specific locations, very powerful. Uh, we also learned that you know, target audiences are more likely to engage in campaign activities that tie into their holiday mood, like shopping and, and sort of posting selfies more so than the, the somber events. Um, we also found that the reach of the campaign was easy to measure and the impact is more challenging. So we use social listening, as Annie showed, surveys, um, the public uh, posting of a commitment to travel every free, and we're exploring uh, various new approaches for the next wave of campaign. And we would, would welcome input from others about that. And then this is sort of a, a no brainer, but regardless of how compelling your visuals and tactics are, using celebrities increases engagement. Next slide. Uh, and just to plug for a Golden Week 2019 campaign, we're launching it next week. And we have new social media visuals, a video this time, uh, and, and social media posts that are all ready to go. So we'd love to have anyone's support who's interested in helping spread the message. And there's a, a Dropbox link there that you can uh, download everything ready to go. And then next slide. And finally, we had a lot of partners in this campaign we want to acknowledge. Uh, so they're, they're posted there. And uh, that concludes our presentation. And, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Jan, and thank you, Annie. That was really interesting. Um, I would like to invite John Baker now from Wild Aid to offer some remarks on these presentations. Over to you, John. Thank you so much. Thank and you so much. Uh, and, uh, uh, to both uh, the USAID team and the WWF team for 
uh, what are really uh, exciting and looks like super successful and cost effective uh, digital campaigns. Um, I think one of the things that are uh, highlighted for me here is how even though uh, China has implemented you know, a nationwide ban, which has uh, received a lot of accolade around the world, uh, from a policy point of view, it's a huge success. But what we need to understand is even with that, um, the need to continue communicating the underlying messages around why we should stop buying ivory and uh, you know, reinforcing the messages around the penalties and continually reminding people even small trinkets and, and uh, tourism souvenirs are still prohibited by law and remind people not to bring them back into the country is still obviously much needed. And I think the statistics that Annie and uh, Jan showed uh, really reinforce that. And of course, this is a message we try to continue uh, to uh, emphasize with our partners because we feel that now is a huge opportunity to sustain this messaging um, in order to really achieve the impact on demand reduction that this ivory ban is offering to us. Um, I wanted to also acknowledge that uh, the success of the Google search campaign, the, the USAID Wildlife Asia um, online campaign, um, Nora, I think, you know, it could have a huge impact if we could do implement that same uh, protocol and mechanism in Vietnamese language. Obviously would need a whole different uh, 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 Vietnamese language specific team to help to uh, implement it. But I think uh, there's a lot to be gained. I know that the uh, China um, online environment is much different. Obviously Google search isn't the platform there, but, it, but for Vietnam, it could be really interesting to see how it would work in Vietnamese language. Um, I think that's something we should look at going forward. Um, and then uh, I wanted to offer the suggestion to Jan and Annie that let's maybe see if you can serve the customs messages in your golden week uh, uh, messaging as one of the different messages that can get triggered uh, uh, by travelers uh, just to kind of put that um, uh, message in front of them as they interact with uh, the different locations in Japan and Hong Kong. Uh, so I'll leave it at that and offer the opportunity to ask any questions. I'm happy to participate in the q and I'm sure everyone has questions also for uh, both of the presenters. Thank you, John. And I Thank you again so much for those remarks. And I do want to um, ask people if you have any more questions, please do add them into the chat box. We have several minutes uh, to go with our speakers here. Uh, and we got um, quite a few questions, uh, Nora and Sunny and David. Um, I think on kind of some of the detailed terminology that you talked about, um, maybe Sunny, if you could talk a little bit more about the served and unserved searches. Um, that was one question we had. We had another one on how is it that the lowest click through um, has the highest deterrent effect? And then I think Nora on that regard, there was also another question regarding cost and scaling. Um, kind of what are your future plans and could you talk a little bit about kind of how much this cost and kind of where you see it going from here? So that's a that's a bunch all at once, and so I will turn it over to that team now. Uh, should uh, I answer should the, I answer the, should I answer the should cost and scaling the first? Scaling first. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, what we, um, what we plan what to do? There's an echo. Sorry. Sorry. What we plan to do is uh, scale the campaign and actually align it with two other campaigns that we are launching very soon. This is the I, Beautiful with the Ivory campaign, which will be, we will launch next Friday, this coming Friday. And another is the Spiritual Beliefs campaign. And we have messaging for these, and we are also using digital media as our main media channels. So all of these will be aligned 
with our digital deterrence so that we will flash messaging also not only to those searching keywords but to the social networks those with the same dem social demographic profile as our online uh, users in order to really target our media and at those who we think intend to buy or those who are already buying so we will give you the details later we're discussing that as far as cost is concerned we found it very cost effective in fact i myself was surprised because we budgeted a certain amount and the cost came up to 15 us cents for actually ad served meaning to say uh, for the 560,000 ads that were served each ad cost us 15 us cents which is quite cheap and a lot more cost effective than if you would play, place ads in traditional media like television or radio. And even then, you know that these ads actually are reaching the target that you are aiming for in terms of those who are actually searching possibly for these products online. So uh, I'll turn it over to Sunny to, to answer the other questions. Are you there, Sunny? Oh, hi there. Yes, I am. Could you repeat the question, please? Um, some of the questions were around things like served and unserved searches. I would just want to note that based on what Nora has just said, uh, for 15 cents per served ad, that's about $84,000, which um, uh, no, actually, no, it's, actually, it's, actually it's, yeah. that's the no, it's, place. I'm sorry, it's not. Sorry, it's not. Go ahead. Yeah, if, if I, uh, if I so, uh, so we have a fifteen dollar yeah. cost per one thousand impressions. Uh, that is what we have. That zero point one five. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, 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 zero point one five. Less than two cents per ad, sir. Sorry, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Right. That's a lot. Of, that's a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, uh, and one, so thing uh, people, one thing. Sorry, I'm getting echo sorry, here, I'm getting on echo here on my end. Okay, I'll just go ahead. So, based off of that, we also have to consider that these uh, impressions are not outbound based only, like Facebook, for example. These are impressions that are served on demand, meaning a user has to search for us to then serve. So they're very contextual within that. And usually that's why you pay more for that. And, and, and so we were able to quite match a very, very low value cost efficiency here. Um, I believe the other question and, was about the... And just one final thing, like I said, we kind of reversed engineer how Google was built. So uh, I don't know how, uh, yeah. So in, in a way, remember we, it, they're really focused to click to, for you to purchase or, or, or something of like this, we were kind of doing the opposite. So. I guess we got um, cost savings that way too. And if I got that correct, the other, that question correct the other question was about the lowest click-through rates ad being the one with the highest search returns. Um, yes, that would be a good one to address. Thank you. Yeah, so the idea here is that because we did not want people to click on the search ads, um, we wanted to generate high impressions but low click-through rates because if we get high click-through rates it would mean that they are relevant and uh, a, a positive driver of their current behavior and intent uh, so by doing the opposite actually if we have low click-through it means that it is exactly the opposite what people want to see and based off of that um yeah we we assume that they are the highest deterrence factor and and one more thing, just like to add to, to to just you know wrap it all up on 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 that specific question was that the one that had the most stern messaging actually had the most um, had the most impact in terms of how we were measuring it. So can can I add to that just quickly? When they saw searching for you, uh, I guess they were really afraid because the idea is to increase perception of risk online. So if they don't click through then they are, you know, fear is instilled. So that, that's the meaning of why uh, the lowest uh, low uh, click rate is actually the most uh, effective. 
But of course, that we will have to determine based on our research. And just to add, total cost is around $8,400 if you uh, have a unit cost for the more than 560,000 ads served. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really good point that David made in that um, in this campaign, you, you were really reverse engineering uh, what Google ads are supposed to do. And um, these ads were really um, inexpensive when you note um, all of this work for you know, $8,400. I think the, the real proof in that, and that's one of the questions that we're, we're getting in, in multiple different ways is around measuring impact of um, both this digital campaign from Wildlife Asia and the work on precision marketing with WWF. And I would like to invite um, both Nora and Jan and Annie to comment on what you think about measuring impact and kind of what are you doing and what do you wish you could do? If um, I, may, I may, I may, okay, ahead. 10, okay, 10. Sorry. Sorry. I have an echo. I have an echo. So, Jan, uh, do you allow me to go first? Is that okay? Yeah, please. Please do. Yeah. Uh, for our own, for the digital phase two campaign, what we plan to do is uh, have what we call a short M&E survey to find out uh, whether those who were actually exposed to these ads have, of course, this will all be self-reported, uh, intention to buy, and then we have a, a norm for social acceptability, meaning do you think that uh, using or buying these products are socially acceptable? And then purchase in the past six months, for example, based on the campaign, the, the campaign period. And uh, this is for the digital marketing. And since we are aligning it also with our Beautiful as Ivory and Spiritual Belief campaigns, next year we're also going to do a dipstick survey with, uh, with, a, with a small sample, we don't have a lot of funds for that, around 400 and then possibly a booster sample to really determine changes in our indicators. We have indicators in our project, as I said, intention to buy and then purchase in the past 12 months and then a perception of social acceptability and then certain attitudes based on the messages that we are actually going to uh, convey. For example, feeling that uh, you can be beautiful without wearing ivory and then the legality of course and that ivory does not bring or ivory and tiger do not bring good fortune and prevent harm so these are key messages that we are going to convey there in a very creative way and based on these we will try to measure whether there were changes we have baselines that we did in 2018 based on baselines we're going to measure these changes and see where they got the messages from, whether was it the digital deterrence, was it the beautiful as ivory and our spiritual beliefs campaign. So this will possibly be sometime in April of next year. Thank you. Thanks, Nora. And Thanks. for us, um, we have looked at measuring impact in a variety of ways. So we did the social listening. Um, we are also uh, we have done our third annual uh, consumer survey in China of 2,000 um, Chinese consumers uh, with GlobeScan, and that will come out next week. And so this is the third year that we're able to measure sort of trends over time. And so we're looking at sort of impact that way, uh, what people are saying about buying ivory. We're also doing a deeper dive uh, specifically on Chinese travelers to try to get a better sense with surveys and focus groups and one-on-one -on -one uh, interviews with them um, and hopefully we'll have that ready in time for Lunar New Year to really dig into why travelers are um, sort of behaving differently than other Chinese consumers when it comes to ivory consumption. And then we were able to build these profiles of users in the aggregate um, using the, the Weibo platform, but due to user privacy rules, we couldn't get you know down to the individual level. Um, but we can understand that you know like it was it was millennial women, and we know that their sort of education level and things like that. Um, but we were we came up against some roadblocks about actually sending out surveys through Weibo because of privacy issues and. But it's just not set up for that, you know, it's not that kind of platform. Um, so I don't know if Annie wants to add anything else about measuring impact. Yeah, just a quick point that uh, in the upcoming Golden Week, we might be able to try some new techniques where we will be able to show some un 
uh, unbranded uh, message without WWF logos through some uh, like third party um, account where people will still be showing the the exact same campaign material, but we will be able to measure their intention to purchase ivory before and after they were exposed to those uh, messages to see if people's intention to buy actually changes. But th this is really uh, one of the most uh, uh, biggest uh, difficulties we face during uh, campaign measurement because uh, social media platform is a place where people uh, would um, would like to uh, interact and uh, see a lot of uh, interesting content. So it's it's difficult in a way that they won't stay long within uh, any kind of interaction if they get bored. And also it would be difficult to ask uh, many, many questions. Um, so uh, we are still uh, testing um, through different um, rounds of campaign, uh, how to make the measurements the best way. Thank you. Um, I would like to invite um, comments from any of our presenters on the question regarding um, how do you think we could take what we've learned from these digital campaigns uh, and take them actually into the Chinese social media context? Is that even possible? Um, and, and for that matter, Vietnam as well. I, I know the internet operates in you know in different ways there, but um, what do you think about that? Well, I, Hi, the two campaigns are. Uh, quick, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry. Hi there. I was just going to mention just very quickly on Vietnam. I think it's very doable and something that I've been um, we've been discussing internally because of the border in between Vietnam and 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 um, and China is uh, a place of high activity. So I'm uh, interested to talk more about that as my initial thoughts. And I believe everything we've done is scalable for that. Just to add uh, to what Sunny said during our work planning last week, we had some discussions. Uh, with our Vietnam team because we also have a team working in Vietnam through traffic about possibly replicating this campaign in Vietnam. China is of course a different matter so I leave it to Annie and Jan to talk about. Yeah I was just going to say I think for us it hasn't been a problem to go through the the Chinese social uh, media platforms because we are supporting you know Chinese uh, ivory ban and work with the government so that that hasn't been an issue. And because we're pushing out our messages on a Chinese social platform to Chinese users when they're in other countries, it's allowed us to reach them when they're in Vietnam and Thailand uh, and you know, starting next week, Japan and Hong Kong as well. So it's been an interesting way to sort of um, to spread the geographical reach, but using one uh, identical platform. So I don't know if Annie has any thoughts about uh, other platforms in China? Yeah, in China there are various platforms like right now the the short video platforms or uh, the Chinese version of TikTok are very trending right now. So WWF through other projects and companies are also trying uh, different ways to work with those platforms. Um, we had one quick question, Nora or Sunny or David. Do you have any idea what the percentage of the total number of consumers that you reached would be for that those online searches? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you mean the percentage to the Megan? Do you do you mean the 500 is a proportion of how many? Uh, consumers that we actually reach in terms of those who intend to consume. Correct. That, yeah. 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 Ba well, based on our baseline in 2018, uh, which sampled uh, population, adult population between 18 to 44, urban. So we have come up with an actual figure 2% actually own ivory and 1% own tiger. So if you use 2015 projected data, which is quite conservative, we want to be on the conservative side, urban within the age range of 15 to 44. And we, we found that there are around 500,000 who actually own and use ivory, and then 250,000 who own and use tiger, and then another uh, 
2.5, right? 2.5 million find it's socially acceptable to own or use ivory and 750,000 would like to buy ivory. So we assume, of course, the 560,000 that we reach online, half of them probably were just doing some educational searches. We assume based on the, the search words. So probably we have reached a little less than 50%. Probably, I, this is just, just an educated guess. I'm not going to say anything, but we assume that a lot also of the, a lot of those who actually uh, did the search also did it not just for buying, but probably to find out more information. So I'd like to be a little more conservative on that end. Is it clear? Was it clear? Was it clear? Yes, I think that was really clear, Nora. Thanks for that estimation, and I, I think your math makes sense. Um, one very last and very quick question for WWF would be: You talked about key opinion leaders. Um, can you talk about who those people were? Um, Amy, do you want to take that? Of, yeah. So uh, yeah, I do see questions about influencers and the KOLs. So. I think the most famous one we engaged uh, was Leonardo DiCaprio, and we also had uh, several Chinese celebrities retweet our messages on Xinan Weibo. And uh, key opinion leaders, we mostly work with those uh, travel KOLs or called uh, travel bloggers. So they constantly update their trips or like diaries, and uh, um, which have many followers. Um, so uh, through their their accounts, they also help us to disseminate our messages to their followers. Well, great, we are at the hour. Um, I would just like to extend a huge thanks again to the speakers that we that we had tonight, uh, Nora, David, Sunny, Jan, and Annie. It was really great to, to um, hear from you. Um, if you can go back one more slide, I, I would like to just point out the links here um, that we have. These are open public links uh, where you can find uh, more of the resources from USAID's Combating Wildlife Trafficking Learning Group and our learning agenda questions. Um, also, I would point out in the link in the chat box, we posted the link uh, Darawat shared uh, with the Wildlife Asia website where you'll find lots of the, the formative research that has been done on demand reduction, um, including um, a scene setter or a, a landscape analysis early on in the project about different demand reduction activities. Um, next slide, please. Here's where you'll find the contact information for all of our speakers. We will post this recording online and I've sent and shared the presentation with Hasita who will share it with our Global Wildlife Program partners. Uh, USAID staff can find the presentation attached to the calendar invitation. So thanks again and I will give a huge uh, virtual applause to all of our speakers. Please come back and join us on October 2nd. We're um, we will be sharing the results of our other learning group on conservation enterprises with the Global Wildlife Program. Thanks again very much for sharing your expertise. And I really look forward to helping us all address the challenge of reducing consumer demand for wildlife program and collectively sharing our knowledge so that we can all improve uh, our practice of conservation. Thanks again. <laughs>